So if we were to uh, put a title on the talk, which is what I've been cur encouraging people to do when they put up these videos so that people can tell what they are other than a date, it doesn't give you a whole lot to go on. <coughs> uh, it would be letting go part two. And the practice is then uh, probably the most common thing I say to people that come at a retreat, they come into the interview room and they talk about things that are going on in their life, very often unpleasant issues, conflicts, uh, losses, and I say, well, we just have to let go of this so that we can move on. And we have some different techniques we use for that, but really this whole thing is a constant letting go. When we start to practice, we have to let, learn to let go of these things our minds are manufacturing. We, years ago, somebody coined the term, I think his name was Siddhartha Gautama, of the monkey mind. And uh, so we get thoughts going in our mind and very often we think they're very important, you know, what I'm gonna do at work tomorrow, what I need to do when I go home, uh, tasks that have not been completed but still we have to let go of those things so that we can come back to just simply sitting. That's not what I'm gonna talk about. I asked one of the folks, what should I talk about today? We've, this temple has been very, very busy the last couple of weeks. We've uh, had a, a long retreat. We've had visitors coming and going. Uh, we've done work on a new building that we've purchased. And uh, the days have just one after the other like a string of beads. So I, I didn't get a chance. I made a list because I was going to be proactive. I made a list of possible topics to talk about so that at least I wasn't caught off guard when it came to topics. But I said to Susan, I said, so what should I talk about? And she said, well, talk about giving up things because I, from a conversation we just had, giving up things so that you can do other things. So it, it immediately ginned up a couple things in my mind. And one of them that I had said to Susan, that I have to mention or it'll just keep bouncing around inside my head, is I used to teach at our local college until a couple of years ago and because of uh, circumstances, uh, they let three of us part-time people go and now they've gone through a big expansion program uh, where they had uh, three classrooms, now they've built five for this program. And, and so I ran across my old <coughs> boss at the college and he had retired, but he was still teaching part-time. And he said, you need to talk to so-and-so because I, I know you want to teach. And uh, there may be openings. And so I went over there and sort of got the ball rolling. And I realized in the last two weeks, I don't have time that that phase of my life needs to be over with and I need to move on with the things that I need to do. Um, and this, this, this occurred to me about the middle of our, I always call it a nine day retreat because some people come a day or two early and some people stay afterwards. So I, just, I, I realized that as much as I enjoy standing on the stage pontificating to these college students, I just simply don't have time to do it anymore. So that's a phase of my life uh, that has to just kind of be set aside so I can move on. And it made me think of when I first uh, became a monk. I was living at, well, I wasn't living at the time at the Japanese center, but later on I was. And I had a sailboat. And uh, I used to go sailing almost every weekend. Well, uh, at one point within the first year of wearing the robe, I realized that I didn't have time for a sailboat. Uh, and why a monk would have a sailboat would be a good question for somebody to ask. But So I uh, sold a sailboat because I just simply did not have time to do this. And we, we have to make choices in what we're going to be able to do. Now, I was born in June, and my mother... I don't know if she really believed in astrology or not, you know, but she'd always read the thing in the newspaper and she talked about it and she felt that people demonstrated uh, their astrological sign. 
And that was kind of popular back then. You remember all the jokes about how you'd meet someone at a social occasion. You go, I'm a Capricorn, what are you? Well, I'm a Gemini, and my mother said I was proof that astrology worked because I've always been very multi-interested. I've got all these different things that I want to do and never enough time to do them. So I'm a good person to, to talk about the letting go. I, first it was a sailboat, and it was a variety of other things. Uh, some of the people that come to the temple we talk about, you know, somebody goes, I have one student that goes on vacation every year. I have other students who go on more than one. But uh, the last time I went on vacation was I can't remember, but it had to be 20 or 25 years ago. But I think vacations are good things. I think people need to do vacations, particularly when they start getting overwhelmed with their work and with life. But uh, monks really don't have time for vacation, usually. Some monks are wealthy. By the way, be careful about those wealthy monks. But they go off on vacation. I have one student that every year he says, he announces that he's going to go on a private <clears throat> retreat. He and another person go off for two weeks at a spa. <laughs> but it's a private retreat, and I chuckle every time I see that, you know. There's nothing wrong with taking a couple weeks <clears throat> off, and there's nothing wrong with going to a spa. It's just when you pretend it's something other than what it is, you know. Um, my last outing was to go to Joshua Tree Park, which is now a park. It used to be the, a national monument. And I spent the day with some friends, and one of them suggested we go because he's quite a camera buff and he wanted to take pictures. And he thought that all the wildflowers would be in bloom. As a matter of fact, there wasn't one single wildflower in bloom. But Jeff took lots of pictures of the rocks, and it's a, it's a very beautiful area. So. This thing of giving up something so that you can do something else. Uh, we had a fellow that used to come to the temple, and one day he said to one of the monks here, uh, who had suggested to him he was complaining about not <coughs> having enough money, and one of the monks here said, well, why don't you get another job? And he declared, which I found astounding, he declared uh, my number one priority, the most important thing to me, is to do the things I want to do. And um, what made this so unique and interesting, and by the way, he'll never watch this video, so he'll never hear that I'm talking about him, so we're safe. And of course, I would never ever say his name, but uh, what makes this even more bizarre is he's expressed the desire to become a monk. But the most important thing to him is to do what he wants to do. And uh, that was travel and visit with friends and do this and do that. But it had nothing to do with maybe because he didn't have enough money to put gas in his car going getting another job. And, and I'm kind of a, like a practical guy. The monks <coughs> at this temple, some of them work now. And when we came up here and built this temple, both of us worked full-time jobs and built this temple because that's the only way we could do it. If we, if we sat down and said, okay, the teacher's ready, where's the students, where's the money, we probably would be, uh, you know, mummified corpses sitting out in the middle of the grounds because that wasn't going to happen. It sort of happened now. But this is a long time later. We've been in this, uh, we've had this desert property for 40 years, and we've lived here 35 years. And in the last couple of years, it's really, we've received a lot of uh, support, financial and moral support from the Buddhist community. So I, th I think about that. I think about someone who's expressed a desire to be a monk who, by the way, is just all loaded with opinions about what everything is. And uh, this is sort of like the antithesis. So, you know, the Christians, they have the Antichrist, <laughs> right? I think of him as the anti-Buddha because uh, you've heard me repeatedly say over and over again, 
to follow the, this path is to eventually stop thinking about yourself. And Dogen Zenji said it, and he's quoted over and over and over that you have to disappear. But other, other religious mystics, Meister Eckhart said the same thing, that you have to disappear. You, and what, the way he said it was you have to die, which everybody goes, oh. But really, some Buddhist teachers have said the same thing, you have to die, which means your ego has to die. Your desire for things has to die. Your attachment to things have to die. And of course, it's misunderstood in the early days of Buddhism in the West as, okay, now you don't, you don't care about anything. You don't care what you eat. You don't care what kind of music is played. You don't care if you see people or not. You just don't care about anything. And, and that's one approach. It's kind of the Hindu approach or the Hindu holy men to completely <clears throat> kill every, not only just desire, but any uh, kind of opinions about anything. Well, I like blackberry ice cream. Okay, it's just, uh, it's just a black cherry. I said berry, it's cherry. Because I just popped in my head, I said, so I like black cherry ice cream. If I go to thrifties, I, I will ask for black cherry ice cream. So I have an opinion. But I don't have the opinion that, uh, oh, bubblegum ice cream is less, it's awful sweet. But I, I don't think of it as being less. It's just that given a chance to get an ice cream cone on a hot summer day, that black cherry ice cream, boy, that's good. And uh, I like miso soup. And I go to this little, uh, we, sometimes I take the monks out to this little Japanese restaurant where we get all this vegetarian stuff, but they have miso soup. It's not very good, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good, uh, but it's what they serve. So I eat that soup and I, I really have to deal with my preferences at that time. I have to let go of it because I realize it's not, not as good as is made by some people. And it's one of those things in Japan, that's how you would rate a cook. You know, they have different dishes and if they can do good miso soup, then they're considered a very good cook. But at some point you have to stop thinking about yourself because that's the whole source of the problem anyway. It's the self that gets attached to things. It's the self that desires things. Now, I got addicted to chocolate here a few years ago. By the way, I had some chocolate a couple of nights ago. I was at a friend's house and had a bowl of Hershey Kisses and I had three of them and I thought, oh man, that tastes so good. That's why I don't buy it anymore because I found myself eating it every day. And I don't know that it caused me to gain weight but it certainly added to it. But I realized that, okay, every day I'm, in the evening I'm eating these Hershey's chocolate, reading my book, and uh, I need to stop that because I'm, I'm falling into a circular path, a cycle, that if I don't have it, then I miss it. And maybe, I remember when I smoked, you know, I'd get up, I came back from uh, Southeast Asia smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. There's a habit for you. Wow. Unfiltered Pall Malls. Oh. And at 11 o'clock at night, I'd look at my pack of cigarettes and i go, I don't have enough to make it through the night. <laughs> and I'd get in the car and I'd drive to a liquor store, find one that was open to get a pack of cigarettes. Okay, of course we have lots of reasons why smoking's bad. But eventually I realized that what was bad about it was I was addicted to it and therefore I could not do without it. And when you can't do without something, the next thing you're unhappy. You're suffering great discontent and unease. And so it uh, becomes important in our practice not to be addicted to something. Doesn't mean we can't like it. The, the biggest misconception people have about Buddhists is, that, oh, they don't care. Well, yeah, we do. <laughs> if, if, we, if we go out to eat or we're cooking food, I told my monks, uh, Vietnamese people bring us soup, what the Americans call top ramen. I don't know what they call it because it's in Vietnamese and it's in characters. But they, uh, they brought us some uh, noodle, rice noodle soup. 
as opposed to wheat noodle soup. Boy, I like rice noodles. I just like them. And I have one monk who's an extraordinary cook, and he was taking the noodles out of the package and cooking them up. And I went to get some one day for lunch, and I realized I didn't have any noodles. So I said to him, don't use the rice noodles anymore. <laughs> And then somebody came through and they said, what can we get you? And I said, rice noodles. <laughs> so I got him lots of packages of rice noodles that he can cook. And yesterday, yesterday or the day before, I, uh, I had the rice noodles and I, I take some uh, frozen vegetables and cook them up with it and everything like that. So I have a preference. <clears throat> I think they're very, very tasty. So you get to have a preference. You don't get to be a slave to that preference. When you're a slave to that preference, then, then we've got problems. Then we're back on the wheel and we're constantly being unhappy because we can't have what we want. Ultimately, for uh, Buddhists that practice hard and monks, we have to get to the point where we disappear. And that's what Dogen said would happen. You disappear. His teacher said to him one night in the meditation hall in China, he said, your body and mind must fall away. That's disappearing. If you don't have a body to think about, you don't have a mind to think about, what's left? Well, somebody that didn't know any better would say, well, nothing's left. No, ultimately you are left, but it's the real you. Because when body and mind fall away, all your aches and pains and complaints fall away and your opinions fall away. So now you can just eat noodle soup, rice noodle soup and enjoy it. And you don't have to think, oh, this is so much better than. See, now we're stepped back onto the path of unhappiness. This is so much better than. There's nothing like a bad cook to teach us to let go. Because, of course, we have to eat what the bad cook cooks. This monk, you can't see, but there's another monk over there, and he just got a book on vegetarian cooking. And he has decided, and I think he'll make a wonderful cook. He is, he's trying out different dishes, and he's decided that he is going to learn how to cook this stuff. And that's great. But, you know, uh, been doing retreats for at least 40 years. And the cook always says to me, what do you want? And I always say, don't ask me. And people that come here, they think they're eating what I want. You're never eating what I want because I don't think it's fair. In the beginning, in the beginning, I thought it's not really fair that you should have to eat what I like because you would eat, be eating Vietnamese and Japanese food all the time. And then I would have to go through the argument of how come Buddhism has all these cultural things? Why can't we be American? So our cook in the winter does lasagna and in the summer does doubled eggs and uh, egg sandwiches, and we get all we, and we get a mixture. But this last retreat we had, we had one night we were eating Japanese food. And so to me, it's kind of like uh, I got on an airplane and I visited a lot of different countries, and I'm getting this international cooking. But I never asked for anything. And part of it is that I don't want to fall in the trap of having these preferences. And another is that I'm burdened with this Protestant thing, which says that I don't, I don't have to have my way all the time, that I can just let it happen. And of course, she cooks for different people, you know. She made egg salad for Wanji yesterday because she worried about him, what he was getting to eat. And so she does that, and that's okay. But the important thing is not to do everything you want to do. The important thing in practice, and, and I think of it as, not only do I think of it as growing up as a human being, but growing up spiritually, is to do the things you don't want to do. I think everybody should learn to do what they don't want to do. Because in the midst of learning to do what you don't want to do, you find out it's really no big thing. And I always use food. Food is wonderful. When I went into the service, I watched men who would get up and not eat a thing. Wanji was in the service, so he saw the same thing. People would get there, and it was not the way their mother cooked it. Because most of us were 18 or 19. 
and they would start eating something in the mess hall and they'd stop and it, was, it just wasn't right to them. So they'd get up and dump their tray and go off and do whatever they did. And uh, I have been blessed all my life is that there really is no kind of food that I don't like. <laughs> you know, I'll eat anything. This morning we had a burrito and this gentleman that was born in Mexico made fun of me because I don't eat hot stuff and there was some salsa, but the salsa was very, very mild. So I ate all of the salsa on my burrito. But uh, yeah, you can make fun of me because I don't like really hot <laughs> stuff because I can't taste anything but the hot. But this thing of uh, not always thinking of ourselves, this thing of thinking of other people first can become a habit. And we have a beautiful statue standing outside of Quanum, uh, Chinese color Quan Yin, and she typifies not thinking of yourself. She hears her name, which is Avalokiteshvara, means one who hears this, the cries of the world, the unhappiness of the world. And so she's very much, she is actually he who over time has been depicted by artists as a she because she has all the quality of a great mother. You know, mothers all the time go without food so their children can eat take their only blanket and put it on their children. Um, this is not only an ideal, it's a reality in life with some people that they do this, that they can actually move away from always thinking about themselves to starting to think about other people. And finally, um, they just completely let go. And uh, there is no other people and self. It is just what the need is.